Let us pray. Gracious God, your word is like music to our ears. Help it to help us to understand through this life of Saul. Help us to understand what your word has to say to us for our lives. Amen. So an alarm is going off in case you can't hear it. <laughs> and maybe an alarm should go off when we hear this, this reading. This is a troubling reading. In fact, the whole story of Saul is extremely troubling. And so I ask, why is this story, the story of King Saul, why is it here? We have two short episodes that we've just read, and they both hint at the tragedy of this poor man's life, which is so tragic and so sad. And so it's logical to wonder, what does King Saul have to do with the story of God's salvation of humanity? What's Saul got to do with that? King Saul, the first king, of the chosen people, turns out, his kingship turns out to be a debacle. Why not go directly to the great King David who comes right after him? If the goal is to inspire confidence in God's plan of salvation, why spend 20 chapters on King Saul? The Old Testament spends more time on King Saul than almost any of the other Old Testament characters. And Saul, his story is maybe the saddest personal story in, in many ways in the entire Bible. <clears throat> Have you ever heard the, uh, you know, a, after a, a great athlete is, has had a, a real success, maybe the Olympics or and who knows, maybe in the U.S. Open or something like that, and it's not uncommon to hear an athlete, especially one who's, who's overcome some obstacles, to say in the wake of their euphoria of having winning, this just shows you, you can do anything you want. You can do anything if you try hard enough. Now, of course, we all love that attitude. I love that attitude of working your way to success. But the problem is, that that statement is factually not true. Not everybody is cut out to do everything, and King Saul was clearly not cut out to be the king of Israel, let alone the first king. He did not have, as they say, the right stuff. You could sense it from the first time we meet him, long before our readings today, when the prophet and priest and judge, really the mentor to King Saul, Samuel, after the, the book for Samuel is named after Samuel. He's, he's the, <clears throat> the mentor who, who is led to Saul to be the first king by God. And scripture in that first encounter, when we first meet him, tells us that, that Saul is a good man, and that he's an impressive man, impressive looking, very tall apparently, the tallest man in all of Israel. But when Samuel, in, the, in that first meeting, informed Saul that he was going to be the first king of Israel, Saul's reaction, well, why me? Really me? <laughs> I'm from the smallest and the weakest clan in all of Israel. But Samuel, the prophet, and the judge convinces him, convinces Saul, and before you know it, Saul's being anointed as king. And yet, from the beginning, Saul's ambivalence, it jumps off the page. Especially this one time, it's still very early, and he's, they're getting ready to, Samuel and others are getting ready to announce King Saul as the new king to, in, in part of Israel. And, and they're getting ready to make the announcement, and they're looking at, well, where, where's Saul? We want to introduce him. One of the great lines, and I quote, 
He was hiding with the baggage. Now, Saul does turn out to be a very good warrior. And early on, he led the Israelites to good victories over the Amalekites and the Philistines. But he makes mistakes. And in particular, he doesn't follow Saul, this prophet of God. He doesn't follow Saul's instructions on behalf of God. He doesn't follow them to the T. Even though those instructions sometimes are pretty, well, they might make us uncomfortable, like the ones about killing every man, woman, and child of the Amalekites. But Saul, he does other things that, that kind of make us wonder. Odd things. Counterproductive things. Like, you know, your, 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 your army's about to go into battle and you want to be physically strong. He makes his army fast to deal with their fear. And pretty soon, Samuel, on behalf of God, gives up on Saul. God and Saul, they, God and Samuel, I should say, they recognize that Saul is not up to the task. That Saul, they see that Saul doesn't have the right stuff to be a strong king. Which leads Samuel, this prophet, to look for another man. And so he finds eventually uh, uh, this innocent shepherd boy who eventually turns out to be the great King David. Our readings today, they capture aspects of the tragedy of Saul, including Saul's, call it what it was, it was paranoia. As he starts to see and understand that God and Samuel, his mentor, had turned against him. That's painful. And truthfully, his jealousy, which rises to the level of insanity, I think we can say. And jealousy of David, who he suspects, and he starts to figure out, will be his successor. It's just a matter of time. David, who appears to have the right stuff. Saul's relationship with David, which both of our readings really start to get into a little bit, it's kind of a classically tragic relationship. Saul and, and David, they love each other and they're, they, they, they value each other. There's, there's this closeness about them. And, and David quickly, because of his gifts, becomes personal armor bearer, personal armor bearer to Saul, and then the head of the army. And this David, who's so multi-talented, it's just amazing. He's also got this musical ability that helps calm, Saul, calm, calm down Saul whenever he's having one of his torments. In the second reading, though, we start to see the problems unfold. The first reading was sort of lovely. But the second one, we start to see the problems, the jealousy that will dominate Saul's all of his reign, 42 years he was king. David had just come, as we said, from a, a great victory over this Philistine warrior named Goliath, the story we all know. And the women, they line the streets, and it sure feels like they're taunting poor Saul. Saul has killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. This poor guy. And he, he, he doesn't handle it well. His, he, he, he can't control his rage, even though he loves David. And he tries to kill David. It's an amazing scene by throwing a spear at him twice, two different times. That was just one of the times in, that we experienced that. And this is just the beginning. The, the story goes on, and Saul is just to show you how dysfunctional he was as a king. He actually uses his army to chase after Saul, excuse me, Saul uses his army, the national army, to chase after David, who has some loyal soldiers, chasing him around the country. And the most amazing thing about those stories where Saul is chasing him around, trying to kill him, is that twice David sneaks in and has the opportunity to kill Saul. He doesn't do it. Twice. That's loyalty. You know what? 
Maybe, maybe, is that, could be, that's the right stuff, maybe. It's good. Loyalty. But for me, the saddest part of the story is how Saul's family, his son Jonathan, and his daughter, who he gives to David in marriage, Michael is her name, they basically support David over Saul. God, that must have hurt. Saul is a man who lost not only his kids' loyalty, though, basically everybody's. God's, Samuel's, his family's, and the priests, who he actually executed, many of them, for protecting David. And Saul, towards the end, he goes so far as to consult with a witch, uh, 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 someone who could help him divine the right, not a prophet, a witch to help him. And it turns out that he, it, right before going into battle, this was to help him decide what to do. It's a battle in which he not only was wounded seriously, but he actually takes his own life at the end of it. What an amazingly tragic story. What is it doing here? Why? Why this tragic story? Why not? Why, why isn't Scripture inspiring us by skipping over Saul and going directly to the great King David, the loyal King David, a real hero who has clearly has the right stuff, right? He's got the right stuff. Well, perhaps one answer to that question might be that the debacle of Saul, maybe it's kind of a lesson about humanity's misplaced desires to make human beings into exalted kings. After all, for the Israelites, their only king, and this is clear in this book, 1 Samuel, and in last week's reading as well about Gideon, that the only king they were supposed to have was God. God was supposed to be above all. And Samuel, this prophet, had actually, he was very reluctant to give them a king. He warned them that their kings would basically take advantage of them and mistreat them. But the people kept insisting. And so God, basically, eventually, God, feeling rejected, basically says, go ahead, Saul, give them their kings. So maybe this story is here to remind the Israelites and us that human beings are not meant to be lords over other people, kings. Only the Lord is. And that we human beings, we, yeah, maybe we don't have the right stuff, for that at least. Wait a minute. Seriously. David is looking pretty good here. The Bible describes him as a man after God's own heart. Doesn't David have the right stuff? We human beings, we have a tendency to put other human beings up on a pedestal. Athletes, politicians, leaders of all types, including, including pastors. And I do believe a major part of this story is a reminder that no human being belongs up on a pedestal, very much including the great King David. All you have to do is just keep reading a little bit further, go into the book 2 Samuel, and you'll start to see David makes his mistakes, including a, the, a gargantuan, infamous mistake of David and Bathsheba, and his life ends with great, great sadness. Yes, in many ways, David was a great king. But at the end of the day, he too was all too human. So where does that leave us? Are we being told that none of us have the right stuff? 
Yes and no. At one level, we are being told, we're being told no. Only God is God. Which is why it took God to do God's work through Christ up on that cross. But we're also being told and being shown, not just here, but throughout the Bible. We're being shown in every other story in the Bible where God works through people, which is basically almost every story in the Bible, we're being told that in a way we do have the right stuff, a sufficient amount of the right stuff. There's a great quote. It's kind of fuzzy who, the, who originally said it. And it goes like this. Without God, we cannot. Without us, God will not. Friends, the Lord is counting on us as human beings with arms and legs and, and, and brains and, 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 and hearts to help God do God's work. Despite the fact that none of us have godly superpowers. Of course, not everybody is, is, is Mother Teresa. But God, regardless of what your, you think your abilities are, God has something for each of us to do despite our limits. God will provide enough for faithful despite our limits. God will always have something for us to do, something good and something loving that will spread God's love, sometimes in big ways and in tangible ways and in obvious ways, as in Haiti. And sometimes in small ways, in intangible ways. Each and every one of us is called by God to spread God's love. And the opportunities to do so, they happen every day. And the truth is, they actually happen every minute. There's always something you can do to spread God's love, just even with a smile. Each of us, each of us has plenty of the right stuff to play a role in God's unfolding plan to heal the world. There is plenty to be done. And God is calling us. Amen.